Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar Tops. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Justin White, a tobacco control researcher at the University of California, San Francisco. Tops is organized by C. Shang from The Ohio State University, Mike Pesco from Georgia State University, and Catherine McLean from George Mason University, and me. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they're not read aloud. And then your comments are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the, on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I'll turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Si Shang from The Ohio State University, to introduce our speaker. Today, we conclude our fall 2022 season with a single paper presentation by Chad Cauty, entitled Tobacco 21 Policies and Smoking and Vaping, Evidence from Panel Data and Biomarkers. This presentation was selected via a competitive review process by submission through the TOPS website. Dr. Cotty is the Oshkosh Corporation Endowed Professor and John McNaughton Rosebush Professor at the University uh, of Wisconsin Oshkosh, as well as a research affiliate of the Center for Demography of uh, Health and Aging at the University of Wisconsin Medicine. Dr. Cotty's research fits broadly within health economics and public policy, where he has studied a wide range of topics, including tobacco control policies, drunk driving, food stamp distribution, and several areas related to health outcomes. His work has appeared in several leading journals in economics, including the Review of Economics and Statistics, Social Science and Medicine, the Journal of Public Economics, the Journal of Health Economics, and the American Economic Journal Economic Policy. Dr. Cotty's research has also been covered by many prominent media sources, such as the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, The Boston Globe, USA Today, The New York Times Magazine, and The Washington Post. Dr. Eric Nissen, an associate professor of economics from Ball State University, is a co-author of the study and will answer select Q&As. Our discussion today is Mike Pesco from Georgia State University. Dr. Chad Cotty, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you. Let me share here. All right. Can you see the slides? Yes, it's perfect. Excellent. Well, hello, everyone, and uh, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, again, I'm, I'm Chad Cotty. I'm, I'm coming to you from uh, the great state of Wisconsin. Um, I just want to start by uh, thanking C and Serena, uh, Justin, Catherine, and Mike for organizing this reoccurring seminar on tobacco research. Uh, it's, it's really wonderful that we have it, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to participate today. Uh, again, I'm excited to share uh, what, what I'll generously call a work in progress uh, titled The Effects of Tobacco 21 Policies on Smoking and Vaping, and we're going to present evidence from um, panel data and biomarkers. Uh, this is co-authored work with uh, Phil DeSica and Eric Nesson from Ball State. And as he said, Eric is uh, generously joining us today as well. Um, so again, this, this is really uh, new work. Um, uh, the data comes to us from the ICPSR's virtual data environment at the University of Michigan. And so they, they have to clear and bless the estimates where we can present them. Uh, and just to kind of illustrate how new the work is, the uh, estimates I'll share with you today are actually just released to Eric and I uh, this past weekend for the presentation today. So, so it, it's really new stuff. And as such, uh, any comments, thoughts, or suggestions anybody has are, are, are greatly appreciated as, as we continue to work through this project. All right. So uh, just to get started here with the uh, disclosures, uh, the current work has no funding sources to report that are relevant, and none of the authors have any tobacco funding sources or advocacy-based compensation that is salient to the research presented today. Uh, no, so there's no conflicts of interest uh, to share. All right, I, I think as we could tell from the title, uh, the policy of interest today is gonna be uh, tobacco 21 laws or uh, often abbreviated as T21 laws. 
Uh, given that this is a uh, tobacco research seminar, I think most people are probably somewhat familiar with T21 laws, but uh, let me just review them real quickly. So uh, T21 laws are going to raise the minimum age of sale of all tobacco and nicotine products uh, to 21 years of age. And right when we think about T21 laws, the, the general concept here is that restricting the legal purchasing age is going to reduce access to all tobacco products during that early phase, that critical youth initiation phase. Um, I, I know that uh, uh, I've seen some recent uh, re recently released studies from the CDC that suggests that uh, uh, regular smoking um, for 50% of regular smokers begin before the age of 18, uh, nearly 90% be before the age of uh, 21. So the concept here, right, is that if we can move out the legal purchase age to um, older age groups, that we can we can reduce downstream adult smoking and vaping. Uh, also, uh, potentially get uh, legalized purchases of tobacco products out of the high schools. There's plenty of 18 and 19 year olds who are still in the high schools. And by moving these ages up to something like 21, we can break some of those social networks um, that might be present here. I think it's pretty easy to think about 15 and 16 and 17 year olds having friends who are 18 and 19, but may maybe less so if they're older. Uh, and so, you know, overall, just like with any tobacco control policy, uh, the goal here is just to try to understand uh, what some of the effects of these policies are, both uh, intended and unintended, so that we can formulate good uh, tobacco control regulations going forward. With regards to T21 laws in particular, uh, we now have a national uh, T21 law as of December of 2019. Uh, but prior to the national passage, uh, there were 16 states plus DC, so 17 state-like entities that passed their own T21 laws in the run-up uh, to the national policy. And here's a, a list of those 16, or sorry, 17 locations. Um, a couple of things I just want to share with you about them. So the, the bold locations are those that uh, we'll be able to utilize in our as our as treatment states in our analysis. Uh, also, uh, you can see Hawaii and California were uh, early adopters going back to 2016. But over half of this list of these uh, state or state-like entities put in their uh, T21 laws uh, after the second half of 2019. So really, really close to the run-up to the passage of the national law. All right. So, you know, in thinking about T21 laws, what are some of the research questions that uh, often get asked? What are the sorts of things that we're curious about trying to understand better, right? And so one is, how do these laws impact those individuals who are explicitly treated, right? And we think about the explicitly treated group that's uh, largely gonna be 18, 19, and 20 year olds, right? So the law comes in, moves up that legal purchase age. How do these laws affect the behaviors of those individuals? Do we see changes in uh, uh, smoking participation, vaping participation, et cetera? Um, also, researchers might be curious about, uh, are there spillovers onto that adolescent population? They're, the adolescents aren't explicitly treated by T21 laws, but they, there may be some treatment effects to them because of, like we mentioned, uh, affecting their social networks, how they access tobacco products. Um, we're also curious, uh, how is the behavior of those who are formally treated potentially affected? So, you know, are there persistent kind of long run effects? Do we find individuals after they age out of uh, uh, being affected by T21 laws in their early 20s, are they uh, less likely to use tobacco products than their peers who were never affected. Um, how uh, does it affect uh, shopping behavior? I mean, we know that people still use tobacco products uh, even when they are not legally to purchase them. So can we observe um, any changes or avoidance behavior as a result of these T21 laws going into effect? And then the uh, fifth question here is, what, what are kind of the net overall effects? Can we measure the effects overall on tobacco uh, and or nicotine consumption collectively rather than just with a specific product. And, you know, so T21 law has now been around for five or six years. And so not surprisingly, there's a fair amount of, of recent research uh, on this particular issue, especially in health economics. And I want to just kind of highlight uh, two of the papers I think that are uh, quite well done uh, that have recently come out for some context. The first one here is Brian Hansen, McNichols, and Sabia's work, uh, they use the behavioral risk factor surveillance system 
as well as the youth version of that system to analyze the effects of uh, T21 laws on uh, different sorts of uh, tobacco related product use. Uh, when looking at the purpose, they find evidence that T21 laws are associated with a decline in smoking participation for that, that explicitly affected group, those 18 to 20 year olds. Uh, so see redu they're seeing reductions in, in cigarette use. Uh, and then when looking at adolescents, uh, younger populations, uh, they find similar effects uh, with 16 to 18 year olds for cigarette consumption as well. And then some evidence uh, of e-cigarette uh, effects, uh, reductions in e-cigarette use, but uh, they only picked that up for, for the 18 year olds. Uh, the second paper, just to mention here quick, uh, by Rahi Bukti and, and Mike Pesco, uh, they're going to capitalize on using monitoring the future. So more similar overlap with the, uh, the youth behavior risk factor surveillance data that, that Brian et al. looked at. And again, they find evidence uh, consistent with Brian that we see reductions in cigarette use here, 8th, 10th, and 12th graders, so middle school up through senior year. Uh, and then also some evidence uh, of reductions in e-cigarette use, uh, not as clear. And I think, you know, one takeaway from these papers and some of the others, I think that's important for context in the research we'll share today is um, pretty robust evidence in the survey data that these T21 laws are reducing cigarette use, less, you know, more subgroup oriented, less clear uh, with e-cigarette e vaping, but although there is evidence of both. All right, so what are, what are uh, Phil, Eric, and I hoping to add here is, you know, so there are some, uh, the prior work faces some constraints that are imposed by the nature of the data that's available to the researchers. Uh, so we would like to try to address some of those questions I mentioned, and then also try to fill some of the gaps or build upon the prior work by addressing some of these limitations. So for example, uh, a, a lot of the recent re literatures and, and studies have been focused on using uh, cross-sectional data structures because that's what's available. These are good data sets, but they're cross-sectional in, in nature. And and as a result, they, it prevents explicitly gauging how uh, T21 laws impact within person behaviors, right? And so we would we would love to be able to uh, observe individuals over time, multiple times, and we could see you know them before they're treated and after they're treated to see the same person, how those same individuals are impacted. Uh, also, cross-sectional data structures are are unable to rule out that um, any of the estimated behavioral changes are are purely artifacts of the changes in the sample composition. I mean, I think a lot of the best papers do a really good job of handling this to the most part, but you can never completely rule out uh, that sample composition changes is affecting uh, estimates over time. And cross-sectional data structures make it difficult to investigate the effects of T21 policies on uh, formally treated individuals, uh, also makes it more difficult to easily study avoidance behaviors over time. Uh, second, uh, a lot of the past research, of course, has to rely on self-reported data. And I know that in the tobacco uh, literature, there are some concerns that being treated may affect the uh, likelihood of uh, self-reporting as a smoker or a vapor. And so to the extent that we have a uh, measurement error that's non-classical that can bias our estimates. And then lastly, uh, a lot of the surveys ask about behaviors related to specific products. But that makes it somewhat challenging to try to get kind of overall comprehensive effects can be can be more challenging. So what we're hoping to do is uh, um, bring different data or uh, an additional data set uh, to this uh, kind of party on uh, understanding T21 uh, policies so that we can maybe build on the prior research and try to fill in some of the gaps that uh, different data sets present for us. So to do that, we're going to turn to looking at the path data. Uh, so the population assessment of tobacco and health, um, th this audience is probably more familiar with PATH than others might be, but I'll, I'll go through it uh, uh, anyway. So uh, PATH is, a, a, if you're not familiar with it, is a longitudinal study of tobacco use and health. Uh, we access it through the ICPSR's virtual data environment at the University of Michigan. Uh, the, their first stated goal uh, of PATH, if, if you read their documents, is to identify and explain uh, both between person differences and important for our research within person changes in tobacco use patterns. And so uh, PATH starts in 2013. Um, we have five adult waves uh, and six youth waves during that period of time to capitalize on. Uh, so there's over 234,000 observations, about 65,000 unique individuals um, that are in the data, uh, includes adults aged uh, 18 to 90 and youths aged 12 to 17. And 
uh, when people age out of the youth sample into the adult sample, we can match them over time so we can track those youths as they become young adults. Uh, we do have individuals from all 50 states and the District of Columbia, uh, although there are seven states that have a really exceedingly low coverage, likely due to uh, individuals moving. And I'll, I'll address that more in just a minute. Anyway, while there is some attrition uh, uh, of the sample in the path, as anybody, as you would expect, the average participant appears in the data 4.3 times, uh, and approximately 60% of the participants appear five or more times in the data. So there's a, a lot of longitudinal uh, variation to capitalize on there. Uh, path also includes detailed uh, demographic data on sex, race, ethnicity, uh, income characteristics, uh, educational attainment categories, and individual age. So uh, you can utilize a lot of information to account for these factors, allows for uh, subsample analysis, things of that nature. Uh, some other just quick uh, overview on the PATH data as a whole. Um, PATH is collected by interviewers who they contact the participants uh, once a year or about every other year that the, the different waves tend to run fall to fall. So something like October to the following October. So not exactly calendar year in nature. Uh, the data is roughly 50-50 male and female. Uh, about 80% non-Hispanic, non-Latino, 20% Hispanic, Latino, uh, almost three quarters white, 17% uh, Black, African-American, 3% Asian, 8% other. Uh, and then here's a distribution of ages, at least for the adult um, uh, sample. Uh, you can see about one third in that young adult, 18 to 24 year old range. Uh, lastly, it's a pretty geographically balanced uh, sample uh, as there's uh, participants from uh, all across the US. All right, so what is PATH offering to us that, you know, what's in there that we're really interested in? So it, it, it contains self-reported information uh, about tobacco use of many different products. So this includes uh, cigarettes, e-cigarettes, other tobacco products, also information about where people, how people access cigarettes, like, you know, shopping behaviors, th things like that in the survey data. And then uh, importantly, there's also some biomarkers information in there, which uh, is really interesting. So PATH collects urine samples, uh, from a subset of individuals and can measure many different biomarkers from, from those urine samples. Uh, the, the two that are going to be uh, most salient for us today uh, are going to be codeine. So the is a major metabolite of nicotine, allows us to get a handle on overall nicotine exposure from all sources, whether they be cigarettes or vaping, uh, patches, gum, smokeless tobacco, whatever the, the case might be. Uh, and then the second biomarker we're going to use here is uh, NNAL, which is a I guess an abbreviation for a very long uh, chemical compound name, which I'm not gonna try to pronounce, uh, but NNAL belongs to a, a family of chemicals found only in tobacco and tobacco products. So as a result, it provides us a comprehensive measure of total recent tobacco exposure. And uh, a prior research has shown that uh, if you look at the urinary levels of NNAL among those who are non-smoker vapors, so don't use cigarettes, but exclusively using vaping, uh, they're very similar to actual non-smokers, people who don't smoke or vape at all. And therefore, it does provide us a pretty clean measure of tobacco exposure compared to cotinine, which is going to be mixed with many different types of products. All right, so what are we looking to do today? What's the, our, our goal for our contribution? Is uh, We want to use this longitudinal data set of tobacco use uh, to look at within-person behavioral response to T21. So uh, leverage the longitudinal nature of the data to see how T21 laws impact uh, treated groups over time. Uh, so we'll look at the explicitly treated young adults, 18 to 20 year olds. Uh, also uh, where the data is available, adolescents uh, 12 to 17, who, you know, those spillover effects may be present there. So they're not explicitly treated, but there could be some effects for this population. Uh, we're gonna be able to observe tobacco use behaviors for those who were formally treated, but then have aged out of treatment to see if there's any persistent kind of longer run effects relative to uh, um, similar peer groups. Uh, we're able to observe changes in kind of shopping behaviors about how people purchase, do they purchase cigarettes themselves? Uh, where do they purchase them from? Uh, and then we're gonna leverage that biomarker data to try to gauge some of the overall effects more comprehensively of nicotine and tobacco exposure, as well as be able to try to compare the self-reported outcomes with individuals' own biomarker outcomes and, and try to see if we can investigate if there is any of this non-classical measurement error that, that we need to be concerned about. Okay, so uh, back to PATH. What is the analytical sample of PATH that we're gonna use? Uh, so in constructing our sample, we're gonna reduce down to 
the youth sample, the 12 to 17 year olds plus early young adults. So 12 to 25 year olds is gonna be uh, our focus area for treatment and control. Uh, this is gonna reduce our sample down to about 131,000 observations, uh, roughly 39,000 individuals that make up those observations. Now, HATH has a couple limitations which are gonna cause that size, its sample or analytical sample to get a little smaller. Uh, in particular, uh, this doesn't affect the sample size too much, but it's something to note. Uh, I mentioned that there are uh, a handful of states that have very low representation in the survey. So uh, Alaska, Delaware, North and South Dakota, Rhode Island, Vermont, Wyoming. Out of those 131,000 observations, they only have collectively 99 total observations. Uh, again, probably people who were originally in, in path-focused states that moved. Uh, so we'll drop those 99 observations so those seven states will fall out. Uh, more importantly, uh, and unfortunately, PATH, PATH doesn't provide a sub-geographical identifiers on their participants. We don't know where in the states they live. And, and since there are uh, some municipal locations, uh, counties, cities, et cetera, that passed T21 laws prior to state passage, there are some states where there are individuals, like say, for example, if you live in Ohio, I can't tell if an individual lives in a place like, uh, like Cleveland, which had a, a sub-state T21 law, or they lived in a part of Ohio that didn't. And so there are treatment and control individuals in those states uh, prior to the state passage that we can't observe. So uh, to keep it as clean as possible, the, those seven states where there was sub-state uh, treatment, we're gonna drop all the individuals from those states, uh, Illinois, Kansas, Massachusetts, Missouri, New Jersey, New York, and Ohio. All right, so that's gonna bring our, uh, our analytical sample, our main starting point sample from our survey data down to about 107,000 observations across uh, 36 states plus DC. So 37 uh, geographic locations of which uh, 10 passed uh, a state level uh, uh, T21 law during um, this time period. So that'll be our, our 10 treatment states. Uh, how are we going to address this? Let me just briefly mention what our kind of uh, empirical specifications, specifications gonna look like. Uh, so we're similar to the Bryant et al. paper, we're gonna leverage kind of like a triple difference sort of model, uh, but because we have longitudinal data, we'll include uh, individual fixed effects. And, and just, just to kind of highlight what that looks like is we've split up our two treatment groups into our, our the two age groups of interest into two treatments. So we've got uh, those who are under the age of 18, so 12 to 17 year olds, adolescents, uh, as one group, and they'll be compared to uh, adolescents in control states. Uh, we've got our 18 to 20 year olds um, compared to 18 to 20 year olds in those control states. And then we bring in that third difference looking at 21 to 25 year olds to make sure that we're accounting for the potential of differential trends between the, the treatment and control locations. So that, that standard uh, triple difference setup. Uh, our, our outcome variables of interest are largely just going to be whether or not you are a smoker or a vapor in the last 30 days as identified by PATH, uh, but we're also going to be looking at those biomarker measures and some, uh, and some other outcomes of interest as well. Uh, all models, like I mentioned, are going to include individual fixed effects and have uh, time periods, so your quarter fixed effects. Uh, vector X is a, a, a vector of public policies and state controls that uh, can change over time and might affect uh, one's uh, uh, smoking or vaping participation. So this is going to include things like cigarette taxes and uh, minimum legal purchase age for e-cigarettes, uh, uh, e uh, some measures of e-cigarette taxes, uh, indicators for legal recreational marijuana, state unemployment rates, things like that. Uh, and vector Z is going to contain uh, time varying individual level demographic characteristics. So uh, a lot of these are going to wash out. A lot of things like uh, sex and whatnot are going to wash out of the regression because we have those individual fixed effects. What's what's going to largely be left are just two things. Uh, one is age, uh, and the second one is that that indicator variable for whether or not an individual uh, that's 21 plus was treated earlier um, in their life. So a, a pre-treatment uh, indicator variable, and then and then we're going to cluster the standard errors at the state level, as you would expect. So. That's the basic kind of overview and setup uh, of the study, uh, the data that we use and the methods we're gonna use. So I'll, I'll pause there before I, I go through the results, uh, let Mike come in um, and provide some uh, further questions in context. Thank you, Chad. Thank so you. let's turn to our discussion today. Uh, Mike Pascal, see whether he has any comments. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, um, uh, uh, thanks, Chad, for this uh, this great presentation so far. It's always a real pleasure to to review your um, uh, review your work. 
Um, I mean, I think that your paper has a lot of real strengths. Um, uh, I mean, the use of the individual fixed effects to, to reduce concerns about individual level heterogeneity, I think that's, that's a real nice contribution to the, um, uh, to the literature. Um, I like that you guys can look at shopping behaviors. I think that's pretty cool within PATH and that you observe uh, not just where people live, but where people purchase their tobacco. Um, uh, that, that's neat that it gets at avoidance um, uh, kind of behaviors. And then obviously the biomarkers is, is a real uh, a, a contribution as well. Um, a couple of things uh, to think about. Um, one is that I think that uh, uh, Texas and Massachusetts, their T21 law, it had a grandfather provision. Um, and so I think if anybody had aged over into the 18 to 20 year old category, um, and then the Massachusetts or Texas law came into place, uh, they would still be able to buy it. Um, so you might want to think about treating those uh, states uh, differently. And there might be some others with grandfather provisions as well. Um, I know Maryland had a car vote as well for active duty military. I doubt that that matters uh, that much, but again, something uh, something to think about. And you know, you mentioned the, the national T21 law, and I don't really know myself how to think about that because, I mean, I know that it did come in place, you know, right at the start of, of 2020, right? Um, but it wasn't, I don't, think it's been like fully promulgated until uh, mid uh, 2022. Others that are part of the seminar might have better information about that. And so as a result, I don't think the FDA could send any inspectors uh, to do inspections or could find anybody until up to 2022. So, you know, there was a perception, I think that there was a federal law, but I don't think it was being enforced at all. Um, and then obviously in the meantime, a lot of states, they were continuing to pass T21 laws even after the federal law uh, came into place um, uh, because they could use their state resources to enforce it, right? Um, which mm -hmm. I think was probably had a much um, a greater bite than anything that the uh, FDA was was able to do. So I don't know if we should just ignore the federal T21 law, in which case that could be beneficial to you guys because you could add even more waves uh, possibly after, right? Um, or if there's anything to uh, anything that could 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 be done there. But something something to think about. So one thing that um, so on the issue of self-reporting. Um, one way that the Abuk paper tried to get at that potential source of bias a little bit is that they did uh, have a component of their paper where they used the Nielsen retail scanner data, and they tried to look within college towns to see if the, the, the T21 effect, if, if there were disproportionate reductions in sales in college towns versus, you know, non-college towns, that kind of thing. And so they found effects. Um, so, you know, that that's reassuring that it was an entirely self-report uh, uh, a bias, right? But I think that it's it's a real concern, obviously, just um, because people are going to be hesitant to admit to, uh, you know, purchasing something if it's now illegal, right? And so the self-report uh, measures are are possibly, you know, biased based on people being unwilling to uh, self-report uh, behaviors accurately once it becomes uh, an illegal behavior, right? So I think that it is really important to try to get at that issue um, issue more. So a couple questions. Um, uh, did you check, did you guys check uh, the re retention um, uh, to make sure that T21 wasn't uh, impacting whether people uh, remain part of the, the path uh, a sample um, uh, at all? I just wonder if, if, if people are, you know, worried about admitting to illegal behavior, maybe T21 law came into place and they're just decided, I don't want to be part of the path anymore because I don't want to have to talk about this stuff anymore that I'm not supposed to be, be doing. That's a really good question. So, uh... You know, there is obviously with any uh, kind of longitudinal data, there's going to be some attrition over time. But I didn't, Eric and I, and Phil, we haven't looked to see if retention seems to be affected by the passage of these laws. That's that's interesting. And then PATH does add more people back in. They add new participants back in in wave four uh, as well. So there, that also creates some issues that we should probably look at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, and then um, the, the biomarkers obviously is really interesting. And you mentioned that it's collected for a subset of respondents. Um, every, do they, every wave then, do, does this subset of respondents that contributes biomarker information, is it the same so that they always contribute, as long as they're part of the path, they contribute both survey responses and biomarkers, or does path kind of randomly choose um, based on people that contribute data in a given wave, if they contribute biomarkers or, or not? Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty certain that the biomarkers is a subsample unto itself, so it links back up. So we, we take the biomarker data, you have to merge it back in. Um, so I think that is just like it's its own persistent longitudinal data, and, but it does match up to those individuals in the survey. Okay, so they're consistently going back to the same people to collect biomarkers then. 
Okay, great. Yeah, that's that's, right. Okay, good. Um, and um, the so have you guys thought about doing a stratified uh, uh, models as well? Um, you know, the under 18s, the 18 to 20s, because I guess one concern I have with you guys using 21 to 25 as the uh, control group, right, is that some of these people is they, uh, you know, they could be affected by T21 and then end up at some point later in the, the, um, in the, the, the path, they could end up in the 21 to 25 uh, age range, right? And so the, the control group might kind of be being contaminated by um, delayed effects of kind of T21 policies, right? Right, so we, that's why we keep, uh, put an indicator variable. So any individual who was treated and then now is 21 to 25, we indicate for them. And then we're actually gonna use that to see if they are actually persistently different and in some way on average from their peers who were never prior treated. Okay. So we control for the, the presence of them and then actually wanna see if they're, if they're meaningfully different. I'll show those results here in just a second. Okay. And, and I, I had some questions about the, the biomarkers, but I think you guys, uh, you're going to dive into that a little bit more later on. So I'm going to hold off on that, that question. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think there are some questions from the audience. Um, I see Eric is answering most of them. Uh, there is a question from Alan Matthews, given racial differences in perceptions of policing. He's wondering if it makes sense to also examine avoidance results by race. Have you thought about a, doing it? That is a great suggestion. We haven't done that yet, but uh, when we get to the avoidance stuff, I can see exactly how that would that would fit in. Uh, thank, thank you. you. I, yeah, I know there are a lot of great results coming up, so I think you can continue. Um, and Eric is answering other questions. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right, so let's dive into what we find here. Uh, so I'll start with the self-reported behaviors. So we're going to just start by looking at outcomes that are more comparable to what we've seen in some of the uh, literature that's used other um, uh, self-reported survey data uh, on different product use. Okay, so what do we have here? This is uh, so our whole baseline sample. This is that uh, the largest group that we have to look at. Uh, I've got two different regressions we'll share here. Column one is uh, smoking participation. So are you a smoker or not? Vaping participation, you use e-cigarettes or not? Um, over here, we've got the interaction with the 18 to 20 year olds. So it's our first and the main treatment group, those who are explicitly treated. Uh, we've got T21 laws interacted with adolescents, you know, measuring if there's any spillover effects on younger populations. Uh, the dummy for whether or not you, you reside in a state with a T21 law. Here's that, that control that Mike and I were just chatting about, about being formally treated. So this is uh, an indicator if you are 21 to 25, uh, but were prior in your life treated by uh, T21 laws. So be able to compare those individuals to their peers. The rest of the variables will be suppressed into the notes. And then we've got our pre-treatment dependent variables for the treatment groups uh, by age group for some context. Okay. So what do we have here in column one? Uh, is smoking participation, what, what do we observe? What do we find? And right away, what I'd point out here is for that those 18 to 20 year olds, we see almost a three percentage point decline in the likelihood of being uh, identified as a, or identifying themselves as a smoker uh, in the path uh, relative to their uh, peers. And, and, you know, relative to the base, that, that's about a 14 or 15% reduction in the likelihood. So uh, a meaningful effect, uh, something that uh, corresponds well with what we saw in the Brian paper, looking at a, the similar age group, very similar uh, kind of findings. Uh, we don't really see anything showing up at this point with the adolescents, so no real spillover effects showing up here, uh, and nothing yet statistically showing up with the formally treated group that would suggest that there is any persistent or kind of like long-run effects that those formally treated are any different uh, because of being formally treated. Uh, however, when we switch over to the vaping side, um, while we see a coefficient uh, for that 18 to 20-year-old group that's very similar looking, uh, uh, we did, it's not statistically different from zero, so we can't we can't really claim that the, at this point we're seeing anything uh, with with the effects of T21 laws on vaping participation in particular. Uh, again, similar story with uh, the spillover effects to the adolescent group and with the formerly treated group. But this is the broad sample with everybody all included. Uh, so from there, what we did we asked ourselves, you know, are, are there any heterogeneous effects uh, uh, across different subgroups? Do, is there are, are there you know, different pockets of individuals who would respond differently to these laws? And so we may want to study them. 
uh, in more specific detail. And then also ask yourselves questions like with regard to the decline in smoking participation. So people are using e-cigarettes, sorry, traditional cigarettes less after the passage of these laws. Uh, what are the possible mechanisms there? Are there can we can we glean any information about is this a a, a lack of uh, uh, people uh, using e-cigarettes less initially, so less initiation, or is this a cessation story? So what can we can we bring any evidence uh, to bear on that? And so we'll start with that kind of story. So the first um, kind of subgroups that we broke out and looked at here was we went back to path and we said, all right, it's very possible that individuals who we're not smoker vapors may be affected by these laws quite differently than individuals who are already using tobacco products. So uh, we start with a subsample of individuals who, when we see them enter path in wave one, they're, they're, they don't use cigarettes or vape at all. So not, not, they don't use either product. And we look at what the effects for that group might be. And then conversely, the other group being individuals who are already, if we're looking at smoking participation, they're already using cigarettes. And if we're looking at vaping, they're already using e-cigarettes right when they come into the path. So thinking about uh, how these two different groups might be affected. And when we look at the, the non-users right away here, what do we find? Well, uh, we see a story that's very similar to what I just showed you with the overall sample. We see uh, about a two percentage point decline here. This is a smaller base. So this, this weight works out to about a 20% decline in the likelihood of uh, being reported as a smoker uh, in the path for that 18 to 20 year old population as a whole. Uh, again, the, the vaping story is very similar. It's, uh, you know, we get a, a non-trivial coefficient, but it's not statistically diff different from zero. Um, and we don't really see anything, I should just point out again with the adolescents, so no spillover effects here either. But we do see some meaningful effects show up with these formally treated individuals. Here, um, this is both for smoking and vaping, uh, suggests that for individuals who were non-smokers or non-vapers when they entered PATH, we find uh, that at, when they're in their early 20s, so they had been treated in the past when they were younger, now they're not treated anymore, they're less likely um, to uh, uh, use cigarettes and e-cigarettes according to these results than their similarly aged early 20-year-old peers who were never prior treated. And and this is suggestive then that there are some persistent or long run or delayed effects of, of, of being treated by these laws. So that's uh, really interesting and uh, we kind of thought really useful to know uh, and a good thing to keep uh, in mind going forward. Uh, when we look at the, the opposite group, those who were already using tobacco products prior, while we get some large coefficients in certain places, we don't get anything that's statistically significant. And so being as conservative as possible, um, not really finding uh, any specific evidence for that group. And so, you know, if we kind of compare these results to each other, uh, it, it would seem to suggest that the effects that we were observing in the whole sample uh, are largely driven by individuals who are originally non-users so that the T21 laws may be preventing initiation, which, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, is one of the kind of thoughts or motivations for these minimum uh, purchase age requirements. So it's good to see. Uh, I, I show you this slide. These are some event studies. I'm not going to, because of time, I'm not going to spend a, 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 any um, time on them, uh, but they're in the paper. If anybody's interested in discussing them, uh, we're happy to do so at any time. Okay. Uh, next subgroup we looked at and wanted to address was, you know, are there potentially differences in how the, the two sexes respond to the nature of these T21 laws? Uh, you know, the, we know that males use tobacco products, especially in the adult population, at a much higher rate than females. Uh, do we find that T21 laws, uh, that the two different sexes respond to them differently? And so we went back to our full uh, uh, analytical sample. So everybody's back together again. And uh, we split the sample up into two groups, males and females, and looking at uh, smoking use and vaping use uh, by those two groups and see what kind of patterns might show up there. And um, there's basically two things that kind of popped out at us right away. Uh, first of all, um, we see that there is a big difference in both cases between males and females. We see the earlier results seem to be very much driven by males responding to these T21 laws. We're not, we're not seeing really any effects with the females. So the effects we saw uh, in the overall sample of a reduction in, in smoking use uh, seem to largely be driven by the males that are in the PATH data. Uh, this is about a 5.6 percentage point decline. So that, that's about a 25-ish percent uh, reduction, uh, but no, no effect with the females. 
And then the second thing is, is we're not actually getting a vaping effect. It's uh, marginally statistically significant, but uh, again, kind of similar story, a pretty notable difference between males and females. And, and now for the first time, finding some evidence of T21 laws uh, reducing um, the use of uh, e-cigarettes. But again, all these results are only showing up uh, for the explicitly treated group. We're not really seeing anything um, uh, jumping out at us that's statistically significant uh, for the adolescent group. All right, the last bit of the self-reported uh, outcomes I wanna share with everybody has to do with these shopping measures and that, that Mike kind of mentioned as well. So PATH in, in, uh, is really great in this feature in that it asks among smokers, so among the self-reported smokers, those who are identified as smokers in the population, it asks whether they purchase their own cigarettes. Like, do you buy your own cigarettes? And then within that group, those who say they purchase their own cigarettes, it asks where they purchase their cigarettes. In particular, do they buy them in the state they live or do they buy them in another state? And so we were fascinated by this and thought to ourselves, well, we can do something with this. Um, so we use this information to try to gauge how T21 laws affect those choices. So what I have here is, again, this is a sample of just smokers. And we'll start with column one here is, uh, uh, do you purchase your own cigarettes? So, so let's start by looking at down here at the, the pre-treatment dependent variable means for the two populations. First, not surprising, uh, this is before treatment. You see 84% of 18 to 20 year olds say, yep, I, I buy my uh, own cigarettes. Now this is before they were treated, so they were legally allowed to. And again, not surprisingly, you see a much smaller percent for 12 to 17 year old population who aren't legally allowed to. You would absolutely expect that to be a, a very big difference here. Uh, and then also we then ask, okay, so what happens then when these when these individuals get treated? We we would expect when purchasing uh, uh, tobacco products, so say cigarettes in this specific example, uh, becomes illegal for this age group, we would expect a much lower percentage to purchase their own cigarettes. And that's exactly what we observe. We get a very robust estimate here, a very large reduction, a 33 percentage point reduction in the likelihood that 18 to 20 year olds uh, buy their own cigarettes. So among smokers, they're definitely using surrogates or other methods um, uh, to access uh, tobacco products once these laws go into effect, once they're restricted. So uh, that made a lot of sense to us. But then the second one, which was, I think, a little bit uh, more ambiguous and, and I think much more interesting is in its own way is among those who say, yeah, I still buy my own cigarettes, do they cross border shop to access them, right? And so if you look here prior to treatment, nearly 100% of everybody who buys their own cigarettes, sorry, nearly everyone who buys their own cigarettes buys them in their own state. So nearly 100% of individuals are purchasing them in the state they live in. But after treatment, especially among those who are affected, the 18 to 20 year olds, we see a big reduction in the likelihood they buy them in their own state. So they're saying, yeah, I still buy my own cigarettes. I just don't buy them in this state anymore. That's very clear evidence of cross-border shopping. Uh, and so they're just going across borders to states where they can still legally buy. It's a very sensible thing to expect to do, but it's very interesting we observe it um, and it's it, it just very statistically consistent estimate that we found here. Okay, I'm starting to run out of time, so let me move along. Uh, the last thing I want to share with you is the biomarkers outcomes. All right, and so just as a review, uh, PATH collects urine samples uh, from a subset of the survey participants, not everybody. And from that group, um, they construct some biomarkers data for us to use. Uh, within that data are uh, uh, individual measures about uh, tobacco and nicotine-derived metabolites. So we're going to focus on the cotinine to give us the overall nicotine response, and then the NMAL, which is our, our tobacco-exclusive measure. Uh, there are just a couple quick limitations to point out about the biomarkers, just to reemphasize. So unfortunately, PATH only collected urine data uh, for the 12 to 17 year old adolescent population in wave one. So there's no longitudinal feature there, and as a result. We, we don't look at the adolescents with the biomarker data, uh, so they'll drop out. Uh, further, the sample is further reduced by the fact that it, that PATH among the adult population only looks at a subsample, so there's only about 11,500 adults overall. And then when we pair that down to the eight now 18 to 25-year-olds um, that we're going to look at just young adults, that's about 4,000. Uh, when we drop those that are in states where their treatment is confounded due to substate implementation, that brings us down to about 3,200 individuals. So it's a much smaller sample, about 9,000-ish observations uh, to work with. Okay, so what do we find? 
So here in the, the top row is, this is our cotinine panel A. So this is gonna give us our measure of overall nicotine effects. And we've broken it out into three uh, uh, different regressions. One is all participants. And then also we'll go back to those initial non-users and initial users to see if there's inter, any heterogeneity there. So let's start with what would we expect to find, right? So we, we found in the, in the survey data that there was this uh, um, reduction in uh, uh, cigarette use that was pretty robust. We found that in the all participants group and then and even more clearly in the non-users group that there was a reduction in smoking participation. So uh, obviously smoking is a contributor to cotinine. So we would expect this to be negative. And then we had some effects of e-cigarettes which would also uh, re reduce cotinine. So consistently we would expect negative effects here especially among the wave one non-users. And, and that's actually exactly what we observe. We, we find um, uh, reductions in overall nicotine uh, exposure among all participants and those original wave one non-users, a little more statistically robust for that group. So no surprises um, that that's what we found. However, when we look at the NNAL, the tobacco specific outcomes, we figured we would see something that was very similar. Uh, uh, the 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 most robust uh, effects we found in the self-reports were with uh, uh, smoking participation, so cigarettes themselves, so that's a tobacco product. We expected to find something very similar with the NNAL, uh, but when we run those regressions, uh, we actually don't uh, observe anything anywhere. Um, so this was a bit puzzling to us. We find an overall nicotine effect, which is great, uh, but no tobacco effect. Now you could get this if we had found you know, lots of uh, uh, evidence that there were big reductions in vaping use, but no reductions in uh, cigarette use, that would give you a pattern that was kind of like this. Uh, you know, there's other products too, which I'll talk about here in a second. Um, but that's not what we kind of see. We kind of expected uh, to find an NNAL effect and, and we don't. And so what we've been looking at recently, again, was a work in progress, is trying to understand what are some possible reasons and, and any ideas that, that you guys have out there for us on this are, are of course very welcome. Uh, we came up with three kind of possible reasons why we might see a pattern like this. And so we investigate those to the extent we can. Uh, so why isn't there a tobacco effect when we would expect to find one? So the first thing we, we thought was, well, it's possible it's because of substitution towards other tobacco products, right? So maybe it's, it's easier to access after T21 laws. These products are still uh, um, uh, uh, going to be prohibited by T21 laws. So we wouldn't expect there to be meaningful substitution, but maybe it, it's easier to get your hands on smokeless tobacco or something, and that's offsetting the NNAL effects. Uh, so, uh, you know, to consider that, even though we don't think it's likely to be an explanation, we go ahead and consider it. And we just re-ran our biomarkers estimates, just redid all of it, but returned to the path to account for using these other products. So, so we control for the use of these other products over time and wanted to see, does that affect our NNAL estimates? And, and then similarly for the cotinine, uh, and, but our results were the same. So there, we didn't see anything in the data that indicated that the reason we weren't seeing an NNAL, a tobacco effect was because of substitution. Uh, the second thing we asked ourselves was, well, we have to recognize that the biomarker sample is a subsample of the overall sample and that compositional change could be driving these differences, this inconsistency that we're seeing between the self-reported and the biomarkers outcomes. Uh, so to investigate this, we re-estimated those self-reported outcomes, but, but specifically only for those individuals who also happen to be in the biomarker sample. So where there's a consistency now between those, those samples overall. And so uh, just for time, I'm just gonna show you one subset of it. This is for the wave one non-users where we had the most uh, obvious uh, uh, smoking participation effects. The, they were the most statistically robust. And so what I've got here on the left is the results I showed you earlier just replicated for comparison, right? So we see a, a smoking, or we see a reduction in, in smoking participation from T21 laws, uh, non-statistically significant evidence on vaping. What might we expect to see here? Well, based on the, the biomarkers outcomes, when we look at the biomarker sample, maybe it's just the case that there's no effect on smoking participation for that subsample. And that's why we're not picking up a tobacco effect, but maybe there is a vaping participation effect and that's why we're still seeing something with cotinine. That would make some sense. So when we redo these, this analysis, what do we find? Well, we, we find the vaping effect actually now really pops up that this subgroup, we're actually seeing some evidence uh, of uh, in, indicating that there is a reduction in vaping. Uh, uh, from these T21 laws for this population. But 
we're now even getting a stronger uh, reduction in smoking participation from these T21 laws, that uh, we're getting more evidence from this subsample that there is a even stronger response to T21 laws. And so that's again, still a, a bit puzzling and doesn't quite solve why we're not seeing anything with the NNAL. So the, the last question we turned to was, could this be because of self-reporting status is related to the T21 policy treatment? Do we have any evidence that uh, individuals are less likely to report simply because um, they're uh, being treated? They're less likely to admit that they're using cigarettes. And uh, th this would lead us to overestimate or even find uh, a reduction in smoking participation when one doesn't exist. So this would allow us to say, oh, in the self-reports, we're finding there's people are using cigarettes less, but then if they weren't really, NNAL levels would be similar. At the very minimum, it's something that we wanted to investigate. And so the way we did this was to the best of our ability was we said, all right, well, we can use the biomarkers data to help us identify people who are actually clinically defined as smokers or alternatively as vapors, but not smokers. So exclusively vapors. And, and by using those groups, we can then test to see if the likelihood of reporting uh, based on a group that is uh, highly likely to be smokers or vapors is affected by treatment, right? So we, we turn to the clinical literature as a guide here, um, and I'll just roll this really quickly, but basically we use uh, the, some of the clinical benchmarks to identify individuals as smokers if their NNA levels were sufficiently high or as non-smoker vapors if their NNA levels were low, but their cotinine was still high, right? Um, so we took those subgroups and uh, we looked at them and we said, all right, so for the smokers and ones uh, and the vapors, what we've identified is these are individuals in either category who, uh, based on their biomarkers outcomes, are either smokers here in column one or non-smoker vapors in column two. And then we look at the difference between the likelihood of reporting as such in the survey data between the treatment and the control group. Does the treatment seem to affect your likelihood of reporting when we know that both of these groups should be reporting? Yes. Okay, and knowing that in both cases, there's always gonna be some people who aren't are completely honest. So starting here in column two, look at the vapors, no statistically, not statistically significant, and it's actually positive rather than negative. So we don't, we don't find any evidence uh, here that there's um, anything suggesting that the vapors are uh, less likely uh, in the treatment states to report as vapors. So no evidence that that's driving effects. But in column one, when we look at uh, the, the clinically defined smokers, we see, and this is almost statistically significant at the 5% level, evidence that there's a big reduction in the likelihood of reporting as a smoker once you're treated by the T21 laws relative to your peers who are similarly defined clinically as a smoker, uh, but not treated by the T21 laws. Now, I wanna caveat this, very, very, very grain of salt. This is a really small sample sizes. So it's just, once we go from the whole sample down to the 18 to 25 year olds, down to the biomarkers data, down to those who we can very clearly identify as likely to be smokers. We just get really small samples. So, um, you know, we're, just, we're, we're hoping for some more NNAL data from PATH soon uh, and add more to this. But on the surface, what this is suggesting is that at least within the PATH, the reason why we're identifying or to the, the size of the effect of what we're identifying of the T21 laws on smoking participation could be overstated uh, simply because of uh, some measurement error issues that are correlated with these laws. Okay, I'm out of time. So let me just wrap up here real quick. Uh, our self-reported, the self-reports evidence, what do we find there? Uh, we find uh, T21 laws are associated with reductions in smoking participation among that group that's explicitly treated 18 to 20 year olds, uh, primarily being driven by individuals who, when we initially observe them, are not using tobacco products uh, and males. Uh, we also see some persistent evidence that uh, T21 laws seem to carry forward over time, that those who were formerly treated are less likely uh, to use uh, cigarettes as well. Uh, among vaping participation, we see T21 laws are associated with reductions in males, in the male population, and again, those who are formally treated. Uh, we also find that T21 laws seem to be associated with an increase, an increase in using surrogates to access cigarettes. I think that's somewhat anticipated, uh, but then some very clear evidence uh, that it leads to more cross-border shopping as well. Uh, within the biomarkers, uh, find T21 laws associated with reductions in nicotine consumption measured as, with cotinine. So that's really great. Overall, we're seeing that there are uh, uh, declines in nicotine consumption as a whole 
Uh, we're not seeing the same sort of big change in tobacco consumption. So in the in NAL, we're gonna, we need to do some more research on why that's the case. Uh, but at least preliminarily, we're finding some evidence that that may be due to a reduction in the likelihood of smokers um, being as honest as their peer group uh, when they're reporting. But more to come on that. So anyway, uh, thank you everyone for hanging in there with me today. Uh, I'm happy to address more questions and hear what Mike has to add. Thank you very much for the very interesting results, Chad. Uh, let's turn to Mike first, see whether he has any comments. Yeah, th thanks again, Chad, for a great, great presentation. I'll try to be brief as I know I don't have uh, uh, much time. Um, uh, one, one thing that might be interesting to check is if uh, T21, if it predicted missingness as well um, for uh, some of the self-reported outcomes. Uh, and that would add nice evidence that people were reluctant. If missingness increases in response to T21, that would add nice evidence that people are reluctant to report you know, uh, behaviors that, that are now um, uh, illegal under, under T21. Agreed. Um, uh, it's, I noticed that some of the, the estimates, they weren't statistically significant, but as a share of the, as a percent of the baseline mean, they seem sizable, especially for some of the young, uh, the effects on the younger uh, students. So I might, you know, talk about those as maybe economically significant, even if they're not uh, statistically um, a significant. Um, I was wondering if at some point in the paper, maybe you just didn't present it, if you would run a Callaway-Santana uh, estimate to, you know, address uh, a time varying uh, a dynamic uh, effects, but that could be a nice um, addition for your, your base model. Um, and uh, I, I had a little bit of a hard time thinking, for some reason, thinking about the buying in within your home state, I guess. I was wondering if perhaps you might think about adding an outcome that is people purchasing in a state without T21 or just re reframing that concept in a, in, a, in a different way that might be, be useful. But, but really nice paper. Thanks again for sharing it with us. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Um, I think there is a audience question from Michael Kobar. Um, he's wondering, he's unsure how the cottony biomarker is measured, but could e-cigarettes with higher nicotine levels than traditional cigarettes affect your biomarker estimates? Uh, for example, if there is less vaping, could that be a larger level decline in nicotine in the body than a larger decrease in traditional cigarette smoking? Yeah, I think this is a good point. Uh, the uh intensity of smoking or just the, the the concentration of nicotine can vary across products. And so, you know, if there's, uh, if T21 laws affect that, the, the concentration, uh, especially if there's substitution between products, I definitely think that, you know, there's something to be said for that. And, and Eric, I'm not sure if, I don't know if you want to jump in, if there is ways in which we can maybe uh, think about that within the path more closely. Hi, Chad. Um, yeah, this is a good point. And it made me think about our AEJ policy paper, right. where at least with cigarette taxes, we found that the amount of products, product substitution was relatively small. So at least with adult smokers, we found that people were pretty brand loyal once they start smoking a particular type of cigarette, then they are relatively reluctant to switch types of cigarettes. And within the path, I think we have we may have some information on the brand of cigarettes and the types of e-cigarettes that people smoke. So we may be able to get at this somewhat, but right. we'll have to go back to the path and, and see what it has. But this is a this is an excellent question. Thank you all. I think I don't see any audience questions coming up. Um, so I'm going to pass to Justin White to wrap this up. Thanks, Chad. There thank you. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Cotty, for ending this season of TOPS on a high note. And thank you also to our moderator, discussant, and audience of 140 people for joining us today. If you're interested in presenting with us next season, please do consider submitting a brief pr presentation proposal on our website, tobaccopolicy.org, by December 12th. And we'll have a hiatus over the holidays and begin the next top season in January. Uh, visit our website to subscribe to our newsletter if you haven't uh, already to ensure that you're going to be notified about next season's opening presentation. Have a top notch weekend. <laughs>